Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all my blessed beloveds out there in video land. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty, and I'm Rusty. Super excited. It's just been rainy and delightful and, um, I don't know. There's been a huge shift. I don't know if it was the trip back from New England or, or what the shift was, but it's been a huge shift and I'm super excited. I'm doing what it is that I want to do in my life, with my life. I'm sharing amazing people from all over the world um, with you and my inbox is full and it, it's, yeah, I'm just, ah. Uh, so what would make it perfect is an RV or a school bus or whatever is going to manifest as a traveling home so that I can continue doing this, but I can do it face to face and share more of the world with you. And that, that would be really cool. So manifest, help me manifest this. Hello, Miss Denise. How are you? Hi, I'm great, Rusty. How are you? I have really been looking forward to chatting with you. Can you believe that? Well, that's wonderful. I'm looking forward to chatting with you as well. <laughs> so what state are you in? I'm in Canada. <gasps> I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, uh, Ontario, Canada. Beautiful country. Beautiful country. Yeah. yeah, I love Canada. I um, went to college in Vermont and a lot of our college trips that were available were throughout Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec. Um, I went to Nova Scotia. I haven't been over to the West Coast yet, but uh, beautiful country, beautiful people. Just love you guys. Thank you. British Columbia is um, one of my favorite places in the world. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. Vancouver Island, there's nothing like it. You, yeah, you, you, I've you like been that far. Yeah. Where are you? Where are you located? Are you in New York? I wish. No, I, I oh. don't wish. I don't like snow. Oh. I'm in oh. Southern Florida. I am in Jurassic Park of the Americas. Oh, okay. Where in Florida uh, exactly? Uh, Fort Myers area. Oh, I'm, I'm Naples is my second home. Okay. We have so we're a, neighbors. We have a, yeah. We have a second. We, I've been going to Naples since I've been 10 years old and we snowbird there a lot. Oh, yeah. there next, time, ne next time you come down, let's do coffee. That would be fantastic. Okay. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's Jurassic Park. So we have every animal large and small scaly and not scaly here. And I love it. Um, you know, I have cougars and panthers in my yard often. I have small dogs, so I'm cautious. But it's, it's beautiful, but I also love the mountains. So in the summer, I like to be up in New England or traveling through the mountains because I love hiking and I love that, that part of nature as well. So I, I guess I winter bird too. I don't know. Yeah, you like it all. I do. You I'm, you a, like I'm a life lover. Grinding. I'm yeah, a I'm a nature lover, lover too. <laughs> so Denise, yeah. I cannot pronounce your last name and I promised everybody that you would pronounce it for us. Otherwise they'll have oh. to read it and do it on their own. Hooked on phonics did not work for me. <laughs> so it's pretty simple. It's Swalanko, but it's got a lot of silent letters. So S-V-A-J-L-E-N-K-O and it's just pronounced Swalanko. Is that Polish? Czechoslovakian. Czechoslovakian, okay. All right, so we're gonna get into it, you ready? Yes, I'm all set. Who are you, what do you do, and what makes you, you? So I'm a recently published author of a book called Evolving, My Lessons of Self-Discovery. Um, and that's really been, um, I, I retired from a full-time career in human resources management where I worked for 30 years always loved writing it's always been a passion i started doing nonfiction articles for newspapers and magazines about 20 years ago and then when i retired i had a book inside me that was needed to come out um and started you know i had various versions of it and then when covid hit last year i really got serious about it and i devoted you know full-time hours to writing it and the result is that it was um, 
published March, late March of this year. Um, so it's only been out for a couple of months now. And now I'm in the process of promoting it. So it, that's a whole different can of worms too than writing. <laughs> it is. It's really hard. And um, a lot of promotion in 2021 is based on faith because there's so much noise and so many people trying to promote things. It's very difficult to um, get the audience, I think. I think it's hard. Yeah, it definitely, um, with the pandemic, it's, 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 made, it's, it's made you do things differently, you know, before you would go and, um, you know, go to Indigo chapter stores, you know, your local bookstores, things like that, community events. Now it's pretty much all done online because, and Zoom and podcasts and things like that because that's our only means. But um, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey. I've never learned so much in my entire life as I have probably in the past year. <laughs> I, think, I think it's exciting when you get to look at yourself and, you know, I'm freshly 45 and I have so much life to live and learn about. And I get excited about that because um, if there was anything that this Corona situation taught me, it was to reset my priorities and to really get good with A, who I am, because I get to spend a lot of private time now. <laughs> I'm not so mm -hmm. busy outside in the social world. Um, but B, what is it that I really want out of this life? And how do I want to step into each moment? Is that a little bit about what your book's about? Yeah, my book is really about, um, it's about self-discovery. So it's about really what is the most important part of our being. And, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on the body, um, some on the mind, and we really don't talk much about the soul and the spirit. So it's really, um, getting to um, understand that and the journey there. Um, it starts with talking about finding my faith um, and how that kind of led me on my path and, and, and my journey along. And then I really wanted to understand all the significant relationships and events in my life because I've had some you know, wonderful relationships and times and I've had some rocky as most of us do. Most of us live a life and we have lots of ups and downs throughout our life at various times, and that's universal. So in, in doing so, I really wanted to delve into that and understand th those universal um, themes and lessons that happen to all of us. And um, my book is my personal story, but I think, you know, listeners um, would be able to relate and just be able to, um, you know, think about their own significant events and relationships and and what lessons have been revealed to them and really that's what it, it's all about and you know i talk a lot about um universal themes like uh, forgiveness uh you know i had a i grew up in a home uh where my father was an addict and you know i had to come to terms with that throughout my childhood and the impact that that had on me and also my entire family um, and, you know, understanding that and getting to a place of forgiveness with him, because when you forgive, it's for you, it really, you know, sets your heart free. It really releases and unblocks all that pent up thing, you know, anger and all those, uh, uh, you know, things that you've had been carrying around for years. So, um, and that's just one of the many lessons that I've learned. And I talk about lots of things um, in the book and sort of my journey to get there. Uh, in my work situation, you know, all the things that I learned from, you know, climbing that corporate ladder and um, how really all those external uh, motivations really didn't feed my soul. And until I really focused on all the internal things that really matter, did I find real joy and happiness? So that's a lot of what the book is about. It's about um, getting um, to understand, um, you know, how to, how to live a life of joy. The bottom line is how do you live a life of joy? You live a life of joy when you find your true self and you're able to be your true self. And that's the whole process getting there. I think and I'm still on that journey. I think it's really interesting as you grow older, you grow 
more aware of what is authentic and what is real. And, you know, it's a step-by-step -step process. These are all building blocks that we go through and faith or spirituality or, or religious doctrine or wherever you want to go outside of yourself, I think is a key component to having balance. You know, you have to have good health mentally, emotionally, yeah. spiritually. Uh, and in that process, it's learning. It's learning how to rebuild the person that you know you are from a time period in which, you know, you might have questioned who you are as an individual because of your environment. And this is a great time to not only write books about that, but journal about it personally and also explore. Yeah, so true. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that a lot of times our focus is too much on external, whether that be, you know, the body, the, you know, we, we focus too much of our emphasis on things that really don't matter and not what really does matter. And to be your authentic self um, is where the only place where you're going to have true joy. That's where you're only going to find true happiness and joy is by being your true self, because there's, there's so many artificial imitation, um, an unauthentic a pass that you can go down and it's never going to give you what you need. I love it when people say to me, well, I need to have the, the big condo here and I want to have a summer home here and I want this and I want that. And, and I, you know, I've, I teasingly say God used to fish with me and I'm just not ready yet. So he's thrown me back a few times and it's interesting after going through lots of trauma and, and things like that, where I look at these people who are so consumer driven with the, the facade of making it on being wealthy. And at the end of the day, I mean, if the Egyptians taught us absolutely anything, all of their stuff was stolen from the tomb. I mean, it never went to the other world <laughs> like they had planned. <laughs> so, so come on yeah. pay attention the egyptians taught us yeah. so much um third world world countries who have nothing i mean they're some of the happiest people in the world who have absolutely nothing um yeah materialism um having um the material riches is not going to do it because you know what it becomes it becomes how can i get more and it's just you know, and then you get more and then you're not happy and you want more and more and more. You got to, you know, you got to internal happiness. Happiness is internal. You got to, you know, feed that. You got to do things that make you happy. Um, uh, you know, our Mercedes may bring you, you know, joy for a day or whatever, but I mean, it's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna sustain. I mean, or those mansions or, I mean, they say most people, if, if you have, um, you know, you, all your basic needs met and you, you know, you have a, a you know, shelter and uh, food and all the things that you need. Um, I think they've done studies to prove that people that have much more aren't happier than those that have their basic needs met. So, well, I think it's a burden in a lot of ways. You know, I watched um, my ex-husband who's got some obsessive compulsive <laughs> issues he had a sports car that he literally shined all the time and he wouldn't let anybody drive it. He wouldn't do, you know, he was so obsessed with keeping this poor car unused <laughs> and shiny. And for him, yeah. it, was, it was a status symbol. It was a reminder yeah. of his father, so on and so forth. But I, and I always looked at it like a burden. Like he carried this huge car around and yeah. protected it, you know, and I'm sitting here going, let's go have a snowball fight. Let's go make memories. And, and his things were just a sack of burden. And as I've grown into my own right, um, I want less and less and less. I'm actually yeah. looking forward to, you know, finding a school bus to reinvent into an RV or an RV or some living vehicle on wheels and um because i don't need much i honestly don't need much in life other than the experience and seeing the beauty of not only people but how they've grown through their stories and nature i mean mountains yeah. and canyons and waterfalls yeah. there's just so much 
to live. I'm the same as you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and if you're ever feeling down, go outside, True. slap on some running shoes. I mean, get out with nature. It'll change your entire mood. It, it'll change your entire way of thinking. But uh, it's funny you talk about your ex. That's why he's an ex. <laughs> One of the many reasons. Yes. He yeah. The title. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I see more and more of the displacement of priorities. And especially here in America, we are so bombarded with commercialism and advertisements. And you can't even pump your gas anymore here. I don't know how it is in Canada. I haven't been in a while. Um, but when you pump your gas at most of the gas stations, they just bombard you with commercials. It's like, come on. Ugh. And it's a whole cycle of mental attack on consumerism when you really need that quiet time to find out what it is that you want to do in your day and how you want to show up. It's, it's really interesting the, the psychology that goes on. Yeah, true. And, and we have news now 24 seven. And it's not factual. Um, and yeah, I mean, remember, you know, the days where you could, you know, uh, I remember because I'm a bit older, but you know, you could watch news maybe one, twice a day, whatever. Now it's like 24 seven. And it just, I got to the point where, especially when, um, because we get a lot of American news here, I guess they don't find Canada is exciting enough. So when all that Trump stuff went on, I couldn't even turn on the TV. <laughs> I, I didn't, I turned it off every time. I just couldn't stand it. It, it was, um, I haven't had cable in 16 years, 17 years. Oh, I, okay, good for you. I'm yeah. one of those people who um, I figured out the cable company and, and they're kind of sly and I'm good with that. But I remember Walter Cron Cronkite when I was a kid, like you had NBC, yes. CBS, ABC, and that was it, yeah. PBS, yeah. which I love. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like six o'clock and 11 o'clock and eight o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, you know, and that was it. It wasn't- Absolutely, it wasn't 24 seven. It wasn't opinion based either. <laughs> they, they genuinely had rules <laughs> as reporters yeah. to look at both sides of the fence and, and tell the middle of the story. And now it's just everybody sharing their opinion, which, you know, good for you, but don't call it news, call it opinion. Yeah, correct. I agree. Anyway, back to your book. What is your book's title? <laughs> Did you go through that? Sorry, we could talk all day. Um, it's called Evolving, My Lessons of Self-Discovery. And where do and you really, find It's because um, I think we're all, like, I, I don't think, you know, once we feel that we're there, then, you know, I... I think we're constantly evolving and I think that we're constantly growing and um, learning. And I think if you are a curious person, um, you know, you, you want to learn something uh, throughout your entire life till the day you pass, you know, for me, that's how I feel anyway. Well, I've promised everybody that knows me really well that even when I pass, I'm still going to be curious and don't leave anything on your shelves. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that kind of curious. <laughs> hmm, will this disturb your sleep? <laughs> I, think I, I think I channeled an inner cat at some point. I don't know. <laughs> so in the evolutionary process for yourself, do you want to share one or two things that were really pivotal to uh, your internal and external growth? Um. Okay. Well, interesting. Um, how my, how it started, I think I'll talk about how it all started. So my sister passed at a, a very young age of terminal cancer. And um, that's when I really started asking all the big life questions. You know, I really needed to know about, um, you know, life and death, why her, what's happened, you know, where does she go now? All those, all those things that, uh, that you really question when you lose a loved one at a young age like that. Um, so that's really, um, and, and I had, I had attended very minimally um, Christian churches. Um, so, you know, that type of religion, a little bit of my childhood, 
um, a little bit when we had children of our own, we had them baptized, but I never really felt aligned to the religion part of it. Um, I shared a lot of Christian beliefs and I felt, you know, that there was life after death and all uh, those type of things, but I just didn't, I was still not getting my questions answered. So that led me to finding um, spirituality, spiritualism, um, and and that, and I, you know, I was kind of alone back then. There wasn't a lot of people. My friendship circle wasn't really asking the same questions and wasn't curious like myself. So I was really on my own, and I just started, you know, any media, like books, TV shows, anything. I just gobbled up on it and became um, quite, you know, uh, educated in it and interested in it and continue to it's one of those things I think any faith that you have whatever that faith is um, faith really is is a, a backbone for you in your life so that's kind of how I got started and that started my whole journey um, and then you know then it was just you know things that happened after that then I started questioning certain relationships. I didn't have a relationship. I didn't see my father for 20 years um, because he was an addict and I confronted him about that and said, um, you know, um, your alcoholism and addictions, you know, have greatly affected everybody in the family. And I had young children of my own and he disowned me. He said, you know, he wasn't uh, at no point uh, was he ready to hear that? Was he ready to acknowledge he was or change his life? And um, my mom and him finally divorced after 40 years of marriage because she needed, you know, she couldn't live that lifestyle anymore. She was very patient and tolerant for 40 years. Um, so when he did that, you know, 20 years went by and, um, and then, uh, and, you know, it, it, it always, of course, is going to bother you. This is a father. This is a father who won't get help. This is a father who, you know, needs help. Um, I, you know, addictions weren't addressed growing up. Like now there's a little bit more um, attention and more advocacy and we talk about it. And I still think we have a long way to go. Um, but you know, in my day, nobody talked about it. I mean, you, I, I grew up at a time where lots of my friends, uh, grew up in homes with mental health issues and we never discussed it. We never talked about it. We never told a soul. We kept it, you know, hidden. We kept it quiet. And my dad was never confronted about it. Um, and I didn't really, I probably didn't do it in the nicest way. It was probably a very direct, it wasn't a compassionate type of conversation. I think I was quite direct in my approach. Um, and so after about 20 years, he had sent, my daughters were out on their own, but he sent cards and I, I reached out and phoned him and thanked him and um, we made peace. And that's where the forgiveness started. Um, and that's where, you know, I started my path of forgiving because you know, he, he was sick. Um, he had a mental health issue that, you know, there wasn't, he didn't get the help he needed, but there wasn't a lot of help available. So it, it no longer, you know, that's where I learned to sort of separate the personal from, um, you know, this is, it's like if someone gets cancer, it's the same thing with mental health. You know, you have to have compassion. You have to, um, you know, find that in your heart and find it in your heart to forgive. And uh, so that, that really opened me up. And then it's just gone on from there in many different ways. Com you know, I talk about compassion in the book, talk about an open heart. I talk about, um, uh, you know, the mental illness, mental health is addressed obviously because it was a big factor and, and, and many more lessons. There's, there's probably, you know, 12 to 15 different lessons throughout the book. I think it's really interesting as we watch the evolution or de-evolution of humans, we're a very complex, hypocritical, walking dichotomy sack of water. Like we're just fundamentally in a state of confusion. And when I look at individuals with addictions and addiction issues, I've always wondered why we don't preface that addiction is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. And I'm going to say yeah. that again for people to hear me. 
very yes. clearly addiction is not the problem. Absolutely. It's a symptom of the problem. The problem is usually underlying depression, underlying PTSD, underlying mental health issues, underlying yes. ADHD with some generations not having that as an understanding. And we, we have throughout my 45 years of life, you know, I, I was raised with the egg in the frying pan ideology that, you know, your brain fries on drugs and all of this like anti addiction. And, and I appreciate that. I'm not saying it was wrong. I'm just saying that it's not the problem and we need Correct. to get good with the problem. Yes. And I think the stigma of addiction would fall off because you wouldn't have shame and guilt and all of those emotions that fear and continue the substance to calm whatever is going on in your head, which is actually the problem. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that's where my evolution, when I really understood that my father lived with anger, he was angry, sober, and even intolerable drunk. He had such a closed heart and that's where compassion came in. How could you not be compassionate for somebody that lives with that fear and anger and a closed heart for their entire life that they never experienced joy? And I address that in the book. I, I, I talk a lot about that, about, you know, you really have to be able to, um, you, you have a choice in life always. You can go towards love or you can go towards fear. And those are really your two choices. And the, the, you know, when you go towards love, that's always going to give you what you need. As soon as you go towards fear and anger or, you know, those, the, that negativity, you're never going to find joy. Well, and I, and I have to back that up a little bit for those who are listening. It's not in any way, shape or form easy to come up with joy and love and, and trust that those things actually exist. You innately want those things, but experience has shown for most of us that those things are rare and mm -hmm. hard to find and difficult because there's so many people who will challenge you in ways that you know are not healthy and i don't think that especially in your father's generation there was a tool set or education or the ability to say hey you know you don't have to hold on to that anymore you you can release that whereas you and i we've discovered that later in life yeah and yes. we embrace it and we're excited and we want to share it. Yeah. But yeah. prior to that, they didn't, it was kind of shameful if you're a man who cried or, you know, didn't have control over his feelings. Oh, absolutely. There, there was no help. Um, and in fact, it was hidden and you probably didn't ever even admit it. Um, because again, that was, you know, that was the error of, and I, you know, and it's sad to me, it's sad to me that my father experienced so much of that and that no, you know, that we couldn't, that he couldn't get the help that was needed. I mean, I look back at it now and, um, you know, I just, I, I just have such, you know, heartfelt sadness for him that he couldn't get the help that he needed. And so now, you know, in this, error where people are going through their tough times there's so many resources there's so much help out there you are never alone never just reach out because we're an edu we're educated and we keep becoming more and more educated and we're there to help i mean there, there's so much that's available now that you don't have to live uh, a life with a closed heart you know you you can uh, you can get the help that you need one of the things that I learned through my own trauma filled journey was that even though I suffered from a lot of shame and guilt that was misplaced uh, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. um, I sat back and I journaled and I, and I looked at the 
perspective of the other person and found compassion and found gratitude that they taught me what they taught me because if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't be here sharing you with the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. What are the most important things? Gratitude, so important in life. I mean, it's number one. Forgiveness. You don't forgive for someone. You forgive because it's a gift you give yourself. It frees you. And hope. I mean, there, there's, there's simple things in life, but they seem simple, yet those are what really, I mean, if you, if you practice, if you're feeling down or, you know, feeling, um, you know, not so good. I mean, A, get out in nature, as you and I talk about, you're going to feel 100% better. But the other thing is gratitude. Just identify three things that you're grateful for every day. It's going to help you tremendously. Absolutely. Believe it or not, the sand in our hourglass has come to an end. Oh, wow. It Gosh. goes like fast, doesn't it? So give me or give us, as you know, where there's a whole bunch of us, um, more information as to where we can find your book and your book title one more time and anything exciting okay. that you want us to know. Yeah, so my book is called Evolving, My Lessons of Self-Discovery. Uh, my last name is spelled S-V-A-J-L-E-N-K-O. If you want to follow me, I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn. I've got an author page on Facebook. Um, right now I have a sale on and I'm doing my Kindle book for 99 cents for today and tomorrow. I also have Kim, uh, Kindle Unlimited, if anyone's part of that. They can uh, download the book free as part of that till the end of June on Amazon. And I also have um, a paper uh, paperback version as well for sale. So my book's on Amazon around the world. And right now there's a great 99 cent sale on the Kindle or with Kindle Unlimited till the end of June. And, and maybe, I hope you see it. Maybe um, you'll redo that sale later when this airs because you're not airing until almost Christmas, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Secrets of showmanship, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I can, uh, that would be good. I would love to probably do another sale then around Christmas anyway. <laughs> I, think, I think it'll actually be really pivotal for individuals because that is the hardest time with your family and with your addicted family and with yes. your fear and shame and guilt and projections and perceptions and, oh, what a tough time of year it is. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll make sure. Well, I love chatting with you and maybe I'll see you in Florida sometime. Well, you know where I am and it's not too far for you. And you know what? Caribbean Breeze, I think is what it's called. They make the best gluten-free chicken tortilla soup I've had in a really long time. And that's in between you and me. So. Okay. We'll thanks. Good. Take care. Okay. Thanks so much, Rusty. Bye. Bye. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty. I'm Rusty and I get to do this a bazillion times a day. Yes, a bazillion. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration because there's only one of me in 24 hours, but you know what I'm saying. Every half an hour on the half an hour, I have a new guest for about seven weeks to give you 165 shows, which is half of, almost half of the year of inspiration, motivation, love, compassion, discovery, and hopefully it challenges your perspective to learn a new version of yourself to be confident in who you really are and to authentically find what makes you passionate. Know that you're loved, know that you're beautiful, go do something kind. I cannot stress that enough. Every week you hear me say it and I hope that one day it ingrains in every single one of you. Until next time.